Well, hello everyone. This is Grace of GB Maltese. And I thought that I would read you a story that is entitled, The Necklace. I hope that you enjoy it. Let me know in the comments below if you've ever heard this story before. I hope you enjoy it. The Necklace. She was one of those pretty and charming girls who are sometimes, as if by a mistake of destiny, born into a family of clerks. She had no dowry, no expectations, no means of being known, understood, loved, or wedded by any rich and distinguished man. And she let herself be married to a little clerk at the Ministry of Public Instruction. She dressed plainly, because she could not dress well, but she was as unhappy as though she had really fallen from her proper station. Since with women there is neither caste nor rank, beauty, grace, and charm act instead of family and birth. Natural fineness, instinct for what is elegant, suppleness of wit, are the sole hierarchy, and make from women of the people the equals of the very greatest ladies. She suffered ceaselessly, feeling herself born for all the delicacies and all the luxuries. She suffered from the poverty of her dwelling, from the wretched look of the walls, from the worn-out chairs, from the ugliness of the curtains. All those things of which another woman of her rank would never even have been conscious, tortured her and made her angry. The sight of the little Breton peasant who did her humble housework aroused in her regrets, which were despairing and distracted dreams. She thought of the silent antechambers hung with oriental tapestry, lit by tall bronze candelabra, and of the two great footmen in knee breeches who sleep in the big arm armchairs, made drowsy by the heavy warmth of the hot air stove. She thought of the long salons, fatted up with ancient silk, of the delicate furniture carrying priceless curiosities, and of the coquettish perfumed boudoirs made for talks at five o'clock with intimate friends with men famous and sought after, whom all women envy and whose attention they all desire. When she sat down to dinner before the round table, covered with a tablecloth three days old, opposite her husband, who uncovered the, the soup tureen and declared with an enchanted air, Ah, smells so good. I don't know anything better than that. She thought of dainty dinners, of shining silverware, of tapestry, which people the walls with ancient personages and with strange birds flying in the midst of a fairy forest. And, th and she thought of delicious dishes served on marvelous plates and of the whispered gallantries, which you listen to with a sphinx-like smile while you are eating the pink flesh of a trout or the wings of a quail. She had no dresses, no jewels, nothing. And she loved nothing but that. She felt made for that. She would so have liked to please, to be envied, to be charming, to be sought after. She had a friend, a former schoolmate at the convent, who was rich and whom she did not like to go and see any more because she suffered so much when she came back. But one evening, her husband returned home with a triumphant air and holding a large envelope in his hand. There, he said, here is something for you. She tore the paper sharply and drew out a printed card which bore these words. The Minister of Public Instruction and 
Mademoiselle Rompano request the honor of Monsieur and Mademoiselle Loisel's company at the Palace of the Ministry on Monday evening, January 18th. Instead of being delighted, as her husband hoped, she threw the invitation on the table with disdain, murmuring, What do you want me to do with that? But, my dear, I thought you would be glad. You never go out, and this is such a fine opportunity. I had awful trouble to get it. Everyone wants to go. It is very select, and they are not giving many invitations to clerks. The whole official world will be there. She looked at him with an irritated eye, and she said impatiently, And what do you want me to put on my back? He had not thought of that, and he stammered, Why, uh, the dress you go to the theater in. It looks very well to me. He stopped, distracted, seeing that his wife was crying. Two great tears descended slowly from the corners of her eyes toward the corners of her mouth, and he stuttered, What's, what's the matter? What, what's the matter? But by a violent effort, she had conquered her grief, and she replied with a calm voice while she wiped her wet cheeks, Nothing. Only I have no dress, and therefore I can't go to this ball. Give your card to some colleague whose wife is better equipped than I. He was in despair. He resumed. Come, let us see, Matilda. How much would it cost? A suitable dress, which you could use on other occasions. Something very simple. She reflected several seconds, making her calculations and wondering also what sum she could ask without drawing on herself an immediate refusal and a frightened exclamation from the economical clerk. Finally, she replied hesitatingly, I don't know exactly, but I think I could manage with 400 francs. He had grown a little pale because he was a lot laying aside just that amount to buy a gun and treat himself to a little shooting next summer on the plain of Nanterre with several friends who went to shoot larks down there on a Sunday. But he said, All right, I will give you 400 francs and try to have a pretty dress. The day of the ball drew near, and Mademoiselle Loisel seemed very sad, uneasy, anxious. Her dress was ready, however. Her husband said to her one evening, What is the matter? Come, you've been so, so sad these last three days. And she answered, It annoys me not to have a single jewel, not a single stone, nothing to put on. I shall look like a distress. I should almost rather not go at all. He resumed, You might wear natural flowers. It's very stylish at this time of the year. For ten francs, you can get two or three magnificent roses. She was not convinced. No, there's nothing more humiliating than to look poor among other women who are rich. But her husband cried, How stupid you are! Go! Look up your friend Mademoiselle Forcier and ask her to lend you some jewels. You're quite thick enough with her to do that. She uttered a cry of joy. <gasps> it's true! I never thought of it! The next day, she went to her friend and told of her distress. Mademoiselle Forcier went to a wardrobe with a glass door, took out a large jewel box and brought it back, opened it, and said to Mademoiselle Loisel, Jewels, my dear. She saw first of all some bracelets, 
then a pearl necklace, then a Venetian cross, gold and precious stones of admirable workmanship. She tried on the ornaments before the glass, hesitated, could not make up her mind to part with them, to give them back. She kept asking, haven't you any more? Why, yes, look, I don't know what you like. All of a sudden, she discovered, in a black satin box, a superb necklace of diamonds, and her heart began to beat with an immoderate desire. Her hands trembled as she took it. She fastened it around her throat, outside her high neck dress, and remained lost in ecstasy at the sight of herself. Then she asked, hesitating, filled with anguish, Can you lend me that? Only that? Why, yes, certainly. She sprang upon the neck of her friend, kissed her passionately, then fled with her treasure. <clears throat> the day of the ball arrived. Mademoiselle Loiselle made a great success. She was prettier than them all, elegant, gracious, smiling, and crazy with joy. All the men looked at her, asked her name, endeavored to be introduced. All the attaches of the cabinet wanted to waltz with her. She was remarked by the minister himself. She danced with intoxication, with passion, made drunk by pleasure, forgetting all in the triumph of her beauty, in the glory of her success. <clears throat> in a sort of cloud of happiness, composed of all this homage, of all this admiration, of all these awakened desires, and of that sense of complete victory, which is so sweet to a woman's heart. <clears throat> She went away about four o'clock in the morning. Her husband had been sleeping since midnight in a little deserted anteroom with three other gentlemen whose wives were having a very good time. He threw over her shoulders the wraps which she had brought, modest wraps of common life, whose poverty contrasted with the elegance of the ball dress. She felt this and wanted to escape so as not to be remarked by the other women who were enveloping themselves in costly furs. Loiselle held her back. Wait a bit. You will catch cold outside. I will go and call a cab. But she did not listen to him and rapidly descended the stairs. When they were in the street, they did not find a carriage, and they began to look for one, shouting after the cabman, whom they saw passing by at a distance. They went down toward the Seine, in despair, shivering with cold. At last, they found on the quay one of those ancient, noctambulant coops, which, exactly as if they were ashamed to show their misery during the day, and are never seen around Paris until after nightfall. It took them to their door, in the Rue des Martyrs, and once more, sadly, they climbed up homeward. All was ended for her, and as to him, he reflected that he must be at the ministry at ten o'clock. She removed the wraps which covered her shoulders before the glass, so as once more to see herself in all her glory. But suddenly, she uttered a cry. She, she she, had no longer had the necklace around her neck. Her husband, already half undressed, demanded, What is the matter with you? She turned madly toward him. I have, I have, I have lost Mademoiselle Fossier's necklace. He stood up distracted. What? How? Impossible. And they looked in the folds of her dress in the folds of her cloak, in her pockets, everywhere. And they did not find it. He asked, You're sure you had it on when you left the ball? Yes, I felt it in the vestibule of the palace. But 
If you had lost it in the street, we should have heard it fall. It must be in the cab. Yes, probably. Did you take his number? No. And you? Did you notice it? No. They looked thunderstruck at one another. At last, Loisel put on his clothes. I shall go back on foot, said he, over the whole route which we have taken to see if I can find it. And he went out. She sat waiting on a chair in her ball dress, without strength to go to bed, overwhelmed, without fire, without a thought. Her husband came back about seven o'clock. He had found nothing. He went to police headquarters, to the newspaper offices to offer a reward. He went to the cab companies, everywhere in fact, whither he was urged by the least suspicion of hope. She waited all day in the same condition of mad fear before this terrible calamity. Loisel returned at night with a pale face. He had discovered nothing. You must write to your friend, said he, that you have broken the clasp of her necklace and that you are having it mended. That will give us time to turn round. She wrote out his dictation. At the end of a week, they had lost all hope. And Loisel, who had aged five years, declared, We must consider how to replace that ornament. The next day, they took the box which had contained it, and they went to the jeweler, whose name was found within. He consulted his book. It was not I, madame, who sold that necklace. I must simply have furnished the case. Then they went from jeweler to jeweler, searching for a necklace like the other, consulting their memories, sick both of them with chagrin and with anguish. They found in a shop at the Palais Royal a string of diamonds which seemed to them exactly like the one they looked for. It was worth 40,000 francs, but they could have it for 36. So they begged the jeweler not to sell it for three days yet, and they made a bargain that he should buy it back for 34,000 francs in case they found the other one before the end of February. Loisel possessed 18,000 francs, which his father had left him. He would borrow the rest. He did borrow, asking a thousand francs of one, five hundred of another, five louis here, three louis there. He gave notes, took up ruinous obligations, dealt with usurers and all the race of lenders. He compromised all the rest of his life, risked his signature without even knowing if he could meet it and frightened by the pains yet to come, by the black misery which was about to fall upon him, by the prospect of all the physical privations and of all the moral tortures which he was to suffer. He went to get the new necklace, putting down upon the merchant's counter 36,000 francs. When Mademoiselle Loisel took back the necklace. Mademoiselle Forcier said to her with a chilly manner, You should have returned it sooner. I might have needed it. She did not open the case, as her friend had so much feared. If she had detected the substitution, what would she have thought? What would she have said? Would she have not taken Mademoiselle Loisel for a thief? Mademoiselle Loisel now knew the horrible existence of the needy. She took her part, moreover, all in a sudden with heroism. That dreadful debt must be paid. She would pay it. They dismissed their servant. They changed their lodgings and rented a garret under the roof. 
She came to know what heavy housework meant and the odious cares of the kitchen. She washed the dishes using her rosy nails on the greasy pots and pans. She washed the dirty linen, the shirts, and the dishcloth. She had dried upon a line. She carried the slops down to the street every morning and carried up the water, stopping for breath at every landing. And, dressed like a woman of the people, she went to the fruitier, the grocer, the butcher, her basket on her arm bargaining, insulted, defending her miserable money sou by sou. Each month they had to meet some notes and renew others to obtain more time. Her husband worked in the evening making a fair copy of some tradesmen's accounts, and late at night he often copied manuscript for five sous a page. And this life lasted ten years. At the end of ten years, they had paid everything, everything, with the rates of usury and the accumulations of the compound interest. Mademoiselle Loiselle looked old now. She had become the woman of impoverished households, strong and hard and rough, with frowsy hair, skirts askew, and red hands. She talked loud while washing the floor with great swishes of water. But sometimes, when her husband was at the office, she sat down near the window, and she thought of the wonderful evening of long ago, of that ball where she had been so beautiful and so admired. What would have happened if she had not lost that necklace? Who knows? Who knows? How life is strange and changeful. How little a thing is needed for us to be lost or to be saved. But one Sunday, having gone to take a walk to refresh herself from the labors of the week, she suddenly perceived a woman who was leading a child. It was Mademoiselle Forestier. Still young, still beautiful, still charming. Mademoiselle Loiselle felt moved. Was she going to speak to her? Yes, certainly. And now that she had paid, she was going to tell her all about it. Why not? So she went up. Good day, Jean. The other, astonished to be familiarly, familiar, familiarly, addressed by this plain good wife, did not recognize her at all and, sta and stammered, but madame, I do not know, um, you must have been mistaken. No, I am Matilda Lucille. Her friend uttered a cry. Oh, my poor Matilda, how you were changed. Yes, I have had days hard enough since I have seen you, days wretched enough, and that because of you. Of me? How so? Do you remember that diamond necklace which you let me to wear at the ministerial ball? Yes. Well? Well, I lost it. What do you mean? You brought it back. I brought you back another just like it, and for this we have been ten years paying. You can understand that it was not easy for us, us who had nothing. At last it is ended, and I am very glad. Mademoiselle Forcier had stopped. You say that you bought a necklace of diamonds to replace mine? Yes, you never noticed it then. They were very like. And she smiled with a joy, which is proud and naive at once. Mademoiselle Forcier, strongly moved, took her two hands. Oh, my poor Matilda, why, my necklace was paste. It was worth at most five hundred francs. And that is the end of the necklace. What a tragedy. 
when I read this and got to the end and found out that the necklace she had worn to this ball had only been made from paste and was not worth nearly what they paid makes me think very sadly for her. I felt so bad for her. But then I got to thinking maybe she should have just worn the flowers like her husband had said. Sometimes we want to impress people, I guess, so badly that we will do whatever to try to do that. And I think that just shows us that we really don't need to do those things. We need to be who we are. And people are going to love you for who you are on the inside, not the outside. It seemed like she was putting so much on her appearance on the outside. And at the end, she became something she never wanted to be. She had aged and lost the beauty she had once been blessed with. If she had not wanted more, she would have still had that outward beauty that she so so cherished. But I, I'm sure she... She learned a very hard lesson. Sometimes it's hard for us to know that we need to live within our means and not worry about showing off for other people. And another thing I thought of was if she had told her friend in the first place what had happened, she would have found out right away that the necklace she borrowed was not, they were not real diamonds. And she and her husband would not have suffered if they had. So... We need, I guess, go ahead, tell the truth, even though it may be very harmful and very hurtful, because they were already planning on replacing the necklace. What are your thoughts? What do you, what do you think she should have done? That's a, that's so hard. I think I would have told my friend I'd lost it, but I would replace it. I think that's might have been the easiest thing to do, but poor thing. She and her husband suffered so greatly. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that little story. I thought it was, oh, I don't know. I, I, I just enjoyed it. I even read it to my husband and he liked it. I think it just lets us know we don't have to be something that we're not. And if we do make a mistake, we need to go ahead and I guess own up to it. And then things might not be as bad as we might have thought they would be. I don't know. What is your take? I'm just discussing. But let me know. Um, are you enjoying the stories? Tell me what kind do you like the best? I I'm looking. I look for stories that are in the public domain so that I am not going against any copyright issues. I did have one friend send me some folk tales from American Indian folklore. So I'm going to be looking for some of those and finding something. I will be looking for different things. I just find it fascinating to find these from different countries. Let me know what you think. And I hope you're having a blessed day and enjoying yourself and are able to get a little rest and relaxation with whatever you're doing. Take care, guys. I love you and God bless. Bye.